Hello everyone, welcome to History and Culture. Although the emperors of the Qing dynasty lived in grand palaces and enjoyed sumptuous imperial feasts every day, it's easy to notice from their portraits that, aside from Hong Taiji and the Xuanji emperor, most of the other emperors seemed rather thin, with slender faces and delicate builds. In theory, with the abundance of food in the palace and no shortage in their diets, why didn't they grow more robust? In fact, this was not a coincidence but closely related to a traditional practice of the Manchu people. The Manchus had unique lifestyles and cultural concepts, especially regarding diet and body image. They emphasized moderation and resilience. In Manchu tradition, maintaining a moderate body weight and figure was seen as a symbol of strength and endurance. Moreover, the Manchus were accustomed to physical activities such as hunting and horseback riding, and a lean. Agile physique suited both their way of life and their aesthetic preferences. Additionally, the Qing emperors did not have access to modern high-calorie foods and snacks like we do today. While their diet was rich, it wasn't excessively greasy or filled with sweets. Palace meals were primarily traditional Manchu dishes, consisting of meats, whole grains, and vegetables. Though nutritious, these foods provided a relatively balanced intake. From Emperor Juching onwards, the Qing emperors, including several of the later ones, were all quite frail in appearance. Compared to the emperors of the late Ming dynasty, their physique seemed far thinner. Almost as if one person from the Ming dynasty could count for two Qing emperors. This is particularly interesting considering the Qing emperors were descended from the Jurchen, Manchu, people, who were typically larger and physically stronger than the Han Chinese. Yet in reality, these emperors were not only slim but often appeared as if they were undernourished. According to historians, the diet of the Qing emperors was subject to numerous regulations and restrictions, even stricter than those of ordinary people. The emperor's food and drink were far from as unrestricted as we might imagine. What's even more saddening is that during their childhood, many of these emperors often faced the hardship of not even having enough to eat. The Manchu people believed that for a child to grow into a wise ruler, they needed to experience hunger to cultivate resilience and alertness. Though this concept may seem reasonable, it significantly affected the growth of these children. The Tongji Emperor is a typical example. He ascended to the throne at the age of six after his father passed away, and his mother, Empress Dowager Cixi, began strictly enforcing the ancestral rules on him. Cixi believed that only by making Tongji endure hardships from a young age could he grow into a qualified emperor. As a result, Tongji often suffered from hunger during his childhood, which affected his health and physical development. Historical records indicate that the Xianfeng Emperor passed away in the eleventh year of his reign, 1861. And his only surviving son, the six-year-old Zaichuan, ascended the throne as the Tongji Emperor. Since he was still very young, Empress Dowager Cixi and Empress Dowager Xian acted as regents, assisting the young emperor in handling state affairs. Zaichuan was Xianfeng's only surviving son and the biological son of Empress Dowager Cixi. In July of the second year of Tongji's reign, 1863, Empress Dowager Cixi issued an edict appointing Prince Hui, Mianyu, to oversee the emperor's studies. She also assigned Mianyu's sons, Ixiang and Ixuan, as study companions for the emperor. The young emperor's studies were extremely demanding, covering subjects such as Mongolian, Manchu, Qing history, Chinese classics, archery, horseback riding, and shooting. The study of Chinese classics included extensive topics such as history, composition, poetry, and calligraphy. Moreover, Tongji's daily schedule was very tight, leaving little time for leisure. There were only a few holidays throughout the year, such as the New Year, Lantern Festival, the Emperor's Birthday, Dragon Boat Festival, and Mid-Autumn Festival. With only a half-month summer break. The pressures of these rigorous studies and lifestyle posed significant challenges for the young Tongji Emperor. 
It is worth mentioning that the Tongji period occurred during a unique historical moment, which presented both challenges and opportunities. Domestically, the country was recovering from the social upheavals of the Taiping Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion. Internationally, it was a brief respite between the two invasions by the Anglo-French forces and the Eight-Nation Alliance. This period of relative calm between two major storms provided a window for reform during the Tongji reign. Unlike the reigns of Daoguang and Xianfeng, or the later reigns of Guangxu and Xiantong, this period offered a rare opportunity for the implementation of new policies and reforms. During the reign of the Tongji Emperor, Empress Dowagers Cixi and Xian assisted in governance through Regency Behind the Curtain, working alongside Prince Gong and Isin to manage state affairs. Together, they collaborated to push for reforms. Under the leadership of the Isin faction, key initiatives of the new policies included establishing the Zongli Yaman, Office for General Management. Creating the Tungguan Guan, School of Combined Learning, founding modern schools. Sending students abroad, establishing factories and mines, and constructing railways. These measures marked China's initial attempts to learn from Western modernization methods and gradually move toward openness and progress. In the military realm, the Qing government realized the necessity of strengthening military power and industrial capabilities. To achieve this, important officials such as Zheng Guofan, Li Hongzhang, and Zhuo Zongtang successively established modern military factories in places like Shanghai, Nanjing, and Fuzhou, hiring many foreign experts for technical guidance. This series of initiatives became known as the Self-Strengthening Movement. Specifically, it wasn't until the third year of Tongji, 1864, that the Qing government officially began setting up large-scale arms factories. By that time, over 20 military factories had been established, including the Jiangnan Arsenal, Jinling Arsenal, Fuzhou Arsenal, Tianjin Machinery Bureau, and Xi'an Machinery Bureau. Among them, the arsenals in Jiangnan, Jinling, Fuzhou, Tianjin, and Hanyang were particularly large and significant. The Jiangnan Arsenal was the largest and most representative military industrial base planned by Zheng Guofan and operated by Li Hongzhang. To enhance production capacity, Li took innovative measures. For example, in the fourth year of Tongji, 1865, he commissioned customs official Ding Richong to purchase an American-owned ironworks in Hongkou and relocated two foreign artillery bureaus from Shanghai and Suzhou to establish a large military manufacturing bureau in Shanghai. In the sixth year of Tongji, 1867, Zheng Guofan proposed building steamships at this factory, and 2% of the customs revenue from Shanghai was allocated to shipbuilding costs. These efforts not only improved China's military manufacturing capabilities but also laid the groundwork for later modernization. In short, through the self-strengthening movement, the Qing dynasty gradually introduced advanced Western technologies and established multiple military factories, improving its self-sufficiency. This process marked China's initial attempts at self-modernization in response to external pressures. In education, the Qing government implemented several measures during the Tongji era to modernize the educational system, including founding foreign language schools, vocational schools, and military academies, as well as sending students abroad. The earliest modern school was the Tungguan Guan in Beijing. This school initially selected ten students from the eight banner families in the capital and hired British missionary John S. Burden as a teacher. In addition to foreign teachers instructing in languages, the school also invited Chinese scholars like Su Shulin to teach Confucian classics, balancing the needs of traditional and modern education. Moreover, new schools related to military and industrial education were established during the Tongji era, such as the mechanical school set up by the Jiangnan Arsenal and the naval school, Choshu Tangiju, established by Zhuo Zongtang at the Fuzhou Arsenal in the fifth year of Tongji, 1866. This school emphasized both natural science education and military training, aiming to train naval and shipbuilding talents. 
It was one of China's earliest vocational technical schools. Beyond domestic educational reforms, the Tongji period also saw active promotion of overseas study. In 1872, the Qing government sent the first group of 30 young students abroad to study in the United States, an event known as the First Overseas Mission of Young Students. These students later became prominent figures in China's political, military, academic, and business sectors, contributing significantly to the country's modernization efforts. Statistics show that of these returned students, 24 engaged in administrative and diplomatic work. With 12 becoming consuls or ministers, two becoming deputy foreign ministers, and one serving as a cabinet minister. In the Navy, 20 students joined, and 14 became naval officers. Five pursued education, with two becoming university presidents. While 30 entered industry, with nine managing industrial enterprises. Six becoming engineers, and three holding railway director positions. Unfortunately, the Tongji Emperor contracted smallpox in the 13th year of his reign, 1874, and passed away on January 12 of the following year, at the young age of 19. His death marked the end of a phase of the self-strengthening movement, posing new challenges for China's modernization process. According to some historians, although the Tongji Emperor's reign was brief, he demonstrated significant diligence in promoting reform and modernization. Additionally, most Qing emperors, when faced with internal and external pressures, exhibited considerable enthusiasm for governance and concern for the country's future. This is the History and Culture Channel. Liking and subscribing are the greatest help and support to us. Thank you everyone and see you in the next time.